Good evening to those of you who are with us here in Roosevelt University's Gans Hall, those of you watching the live stream, and those of you who will access this event as a recording, welcome to the American Dream Reconsidered Conference. My name is Kim Ruffin, and as an Associate Professor of English at Roosevelt, it brings me great pleasure to introduce the two writers who are part of this panel, which celebrates a third writer. In fact, the first part of this evening's event title comes from lines of a poem. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. Emma Lazarus, the Statue of Liberty, and the problem of immigration. This panel will be a conversation about Emma Lazarus, perhaps the preeminent Jewish intellectual in the late 19th century, America, and famously, the author of the sonnet, The New Colossus, inscribed on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. The statue itself is a monument of hope and opportunity, but Lazarus's poem gets at the nerve of what makes hope and opportunity in America possible. Our moderator this evening is Anne-Marie Cusick, who is the Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Journalism here at Roosevelt University. She will be in conversation with Professor Esther Shore, who is the Leonard L. Milberg Professor of American Jewish Studies, Professor of English, and Chair of the Humanities Council at Princeton University. In addition to being a biographer, She's a poet, popular press reviewer and essayist, and scholar who has written broadly in several areas of academic expertise. Among her many big book projects are Bearing the Dead, The British Culture of Mourning from the Enlightenment to Victoria, The Other Mary Shelley, Beyond Frankenstein, and Bridge of Words, Esperanto and the Dream of a Universal Language. We are pleased to host her this evening to discuss insights on her biography, Emma Lazarus, which won the 2006 National Jewish Book Award. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Professor Shore. I want to say how pleased I am to be part of this conversation with Professor Shore and Welcome, Esther. We're Thank very you so glad much. you made it to Roosevelt. I am too. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Um, so I wondered if you'd like to start out by reading The New Colossus, the poem that um, Emma Lazarus is most known for. Sure. We'll be talking about w what you see in it. This is a poem that Emma Lazarus wrote to raise money for the building of the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the People of France gave the statue, but the deal was that the U.S. would provide the pedestal. And it turned out to be very hard to raise the money, hard to make people interested in this. So the idea arose to have an art auction. And as part of the art, art auction, a portfolio of original poems was going to be auctioned off. And this poem was written for the portfolio for the art auction. The New Colossus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So there's been a kind of struggle over the meaning of, of that poem, um, and especially recently. You keep a uh, 
Google alert for the word huddled masses that you said you started in about 2016. Um, I actually started it early. I know I said 2016, but I, I think looked it was earlier. I started okay. it earlier than that. Yeah. So what made you start it and, and what did you learn? From I um I published this book in 2006. So I've I've been Emma Lazarus's biographer for for years. And I started the Google alert, which means at midnight every night, I get an email that has citations to huddled masses. That's, that's the phrase. So I, in the morning, the first thing I do is look at this. And I can see what major newspapers, what small local papers, uh, what contests there are involving the poem. And I started it uh, after... I think shortly before Donald Trump declared his his uh, candidacy for president, which was 2015. And so I had already been looking at it and I noticed this massive uptick of citations to the poem. Uh, and the poem is cited uh, often to, to sort of support, you know, with something incontrovertible. It's like citing scripture at the end of a letter to the editor saying, uh, immigration is part of the American fabric. Uh, this is our most dearly held value. Uh, this is a betrayal of our most dearly held values. And of course, it's also cited on the right, uh, including the alt-right. And the alt-right has been citing it for years before Donald Trump declared that he was running for president at the Trump Tower. Uh, and there, uh, a number of different things happen. I mean, the people who cite it on the right often say, uh, this is a myth. This has nothing to do with the statue. The statue is about liberty. The statue is about freedom. And parenthetically, if you look at the website of the new Statue of Liberty Museum, uh, which opened during the Trump presidency, the word immigration is almost not mentioned at all. I mean, it's about freedom. It's about democracy. Uh, it's not really about immigration. So, which is to say, this is these are words that are available uh, and in the ether and are being quoted. But as we both know, it's a portion of the poem you know, that's quoted. Well, that interests me. I, why? Why do you think those lines in particular, and what are they leaving out? I mean, the the first half the half of the poem seems very anti-imperialist to me. So, why the concentration on just those lines? Do you think? It's a great question. I mean, I, I think what the lines do is give the statue a voice. Yeah. And I think because those lines are so widely known, and of course they're the only lines that Irving Berlin set when he set this to music in 1949, Lazarus is, is often associated with that voice, that statue, and this is sort of taken to be her poem. Yeah. Whereas the poem begins by saying... Uh, what we have here is not like the imperial colossus of Rhodes, and that's what the uh, and it's a statue of the sun god striding from land to land, conquering lands. So we're going to have a woman, not a man, and instead of having the the brilliant sun of enlightenment, we're going to have imprisoned lightning, which is to say, uh, not everyone has access to enlightenment. This is still imprisoned. It hasn't been liberated yet. Um, and then the final theme is this idea of mother as opposed to God and a mother of exiles, a mother of those who have been tossed out, who have been oppressed, persecuted, etc. So the, the main point is that Emma Lazarus completely reconfigured the meaning of the statue. It had to do with French republicanism, it had to do with abolitionism. It was a French Republican named Edmond de Lavallee who took the idea to Bartholdi, the sculptor. And she just completely reconfigured what the statue meant. I'm going to go back to the, the right and its interpretations of the poem. So in 2019, and I need to put on my glasses to make sure I get this correctly. Um, Kenneth T. Cuccinelli II, who was a high-ranking Trump immigration official, rephrased those last lines to say, 
give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. And later he, um, and this was in an interview uh, with NPR, I believe, he said that Lazarus was writing about people coming from Europe. Um, so this was uh, in reference to the Trump administration's public charge rule, which would favor uh, immigrants who, had, who were wealthy, um, would attempt to restrict immigrants who were coming who were poor. Um, and you wrote uh, in response to that event and to some others uh, in the New York Times, what did you say and how did you respond to him? Um, well, Cuccinelli, uh, I'm sure regretted <laughs> rewriting the poem, uh, <laughs> but rewrite it he did. And he cited uh, a law called the Public Charge Law of 1882. Um, and he mistakenly said that the statue went on the, the, the poem went on the statue around the same time as the public charge law, not true. The poem went on in 1903, the public charge law was 1882. And it was a law that prevented the immigration of, and I'm quoting, lunatics, idiots, or any person unable to take care of him or herself without becoming a public charge. And the public charge law, which is of the same vintage as the Chinese exclusion law and the page, uh, the Page Law, these were very early immigration laws limiting, restricting immigration. Uh, it was used to deport the disabled. It was used to deport single women. It was used to deport pregnant women. Uh, it doesn't have a very shining history. So Cuccinelli also um, unfortunately said, well, the Statue of Liberty is about European immigrants as if, well, now we have other immigrants to worry about. Um, but he also said that this was simply fulfilling Donald Trump's promise. Uh, and I think one of the, one of the deep problems with this, uh, citing the public charge law, was that it, was, it depended on customs officers and border patrol officers deciding whether someone was likely to become a public charge. And of course, there was a page of instructions on how to calculate this. But this was such a subjective judgment, um, basically. And I want to add that two years previous to this, that, so Cuccinelli said this in 2017, two summers before Stephen Miller, um, who was one of the architects of the Muslim ban and Trump's anti-immigration restrictions, uh, went mano a mano with Jim Acosta uh, of CNN at a press briefing, and the occasion was the, quote, RAISE Act, R-A-I-S-E, which was an act that, to, to summarize, reconfigured immigration preferences to prefer the wealthy. Um, and it was a point system, and it was famously uh, ex exposed in the press as something that would be very unlikely for any immigrant to, to meet unless they were very wealthy, very educated. Um, it favored people in STEM uh, departments. Uh, humanists usually wouldn't have, wouldn't have met it. And in fact, uh, none of Donald Trump's family members would have met it, including Melania, who was two points short. <laughs> so the Rays Act became the occasion for this uh, press conference, and Jim Acosta simply said, isn't this a betrayal of Emma Lazarus's famous lines? And he read them. And Stephen Miller uh, went on a, a diatribe against Jim Acosta, lectured him that this was not a law, that this was a myth. And that's another note sounded in the alt-right mm -hmm. citations. This is just a myth. Uh, this has nothing to do with law. This is not true of the United States. And in fact, there are writers on the left who also criticize it as a myth, but for different, for different reasons. Yeah, I want to turn to that, but I do want to quote your op-ed briefly. Um, just in response to Cuccinelli's rewriting, she wrote uh, that it neither rhymes nor scans is the least of our worries. I thought that was fun. Um, but from the left, uh, you have with you, I know, a collection from the 92nd Street Y that has uh, a bunch of poems in it. Um, but yeah. there's one in particular that you mentioned that I also think is wonderful by Sophia Sinclair in Memoriam. Would you yes. 
read that? So, so let me back up a little bit. I and mean, my sense of the way the poem has flown through American history is that it began as a very subversive poem. Uh, it was subversive of pieties about the Enlightenment. It was subversive of the idea uh, that America, Gilded Age prosperity, was the, was the true triumph of America. And Lazarus, I would say, was subverting those ideas and those values. The poem fell out of notice uh, very soon after the auction. Uh, it was published in a very small magazine. It was not read when the statue was dedicated in 1886. Uh, it was not cited. It was not collected. Lazarus put it first in the poems that she collected when she was dying of Hodgkin's at the age of 37. She put it first. She thought it was her most important pregnant poem. Her sisters, however, did not follow suit when they edited the first posthumous edition of her poems, and it was sort of buried in among a lot of other sonnets. So the poem was only cited in the, in the 1930s as part of a pro-immigration um, movement, and it was a Slovenian immigrant named Louis Adamic who began citing it, began reading it, put it on their letterhead, uh, and sort of brought it back into the public eye uh, as a pro-immigration and anti-restrictionist poem. So the second phase of this is that the poem then becomes uh, a sort of nest of American pieties about the central American value of living immigrants. And um, it becomes cited very widely. It becomes memorized by students. Unfortunately, that is no longer true. It's set to music, it becomes popularized. Um, and I would say from the 1930s through the early part of the 21st century, um, it was a poem of pieties rather than a subversive poem. But with the Trump administration, the pendulum swung back and this poem then became used to subvert uh, the policies that, that the Trump administration was promoting. So part of that meant that the poem was getting a lot more attention and it became scrutinized critically um, by people on the left and by African-American readers and poets. Uh, and a group of poets at the 92nd Street Y convened a, an evening called A New Colossus. And this is the, the, the pamphlet that they published Everything in here is up on the web uh, under the 92nd Street Y um, website. So there are poems that criticize Emma Lazarus' poem for what it leaves out. And it leaves out a much wider scope of objections to American discrimination and, um, that Americans have not only discriminated against European immigrants, but against black and brown people, and that the sin that they were at the heart of the American polity of American history is the sin of slavery, not anti-immigration. So I can read a very brief excerpt from a parody of this poem. So some of these were parodies. This is by a Guamanian poem, poet named Craig Santos Perez, and it's called Statue of Commodities. Give me your oil, your labor, your fresh produce selling at wholesale fees, the shiny products of your factory floor. Send these, the cheap goods, gift wrapped to me. I raise my debt inside the global store. <laughs> so that, that's one of the least cringeworthy of these parodies. <laughs> uh, most of them make no attempt to get the sound of the original poem or the form. But the poem that you mentioned by Sophia Sinclair, a young uh, poet who's an, an immigrant to the United States, born in Jamaica, um, is called In Memoriam. And to me, it's, it's the best of these poems that, that emerged from this moment of, of critique. White is a state of mind, spangled, 
blinding, shining sky awash in all its shining. White arms spread wide, claimed she was friendly, cried she was mighty, then tracked her mud across my shore, gilded lamp lifting to hawk a fantasy. Eyes torched dark with snake oil, healed vision burnt in blood, in blood ransacked what hungered me, then built a fence that voids me still. Mother, illegal, mother, in exile, spurned, unworthy, told, go back to your country, mother, still yearning to breathe, free. Been tired, been poor, been wretched, barricaded, huddled mass across stolen centuries, undocumenting liberty. Goodbye to all of that. World born wrong, how freedom preens red-throated from your jail. Here lies her empty, here lies her brass corona, her rusted colossus drowned under artless seas. I too will miss America. And those final lines, of course, echo Langston Hughes, you know, I too sing America. It's a hard hitting poem, uh, it really packs a wallop and debunks the statue as a snake oil salesman, you know, so selling something, a uh, kind of masquerade. Uh, and the black vernacular that sort of creeps into the poem and sort of takes a stand and the last lines I think are very important to this, what she calls undocumenting liberty. Yeah, I really noticed uh, from the first line uh, that with Emma Lazarus's poem, you have really a pretty standard iambic line. It's not interrupted. We have two, what you call caesareous, two interruptions, hard periods, and um, it's it's kind of violent or ruptured yeah. right, right at the beginning. And that, that kind of energy goes all the way through it. That's right. And, and she breaks up the breathe, learn, still yearning to breathe free line with a period still yearning to breathe free and then many, many sort of verbal echoes, but sort of now implanted in this, this black vernacular. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so who was Emma Lazarus? Maybe we should talk about the woman. Who was Emma Lazarus? Well, I can tell you who she wasn't. She wasn't an immigrant. And, you know, I have to say, I, when I started writing this book, I, I knew very little about her. Um, I was asked to write the book, uh, by Jonathan Rosen, who was editing a new series for uh, Shock and Pantheon and Next Book. And uh, I didn't think she was an immigrant, but I guess that's the main misconception about her. She was a fourth or fifth generation American, uh, the daughter of Sephardic Jews mainly. I think she had an Ashkenazi great grandparent um, and was a, a descendant of the important Sparta community that was very vocal, supporting the American Republic in the early days of, of the colonial days and in the days of the early Republic. So she was from a very famous family, famous on both sides. Uh, her mother's family was the um, Satius family. Her father's family was also a family who was wealthy. They made their money in sugar, sugar refining. And Lazarus shows her awareness of this in a, a poem she would write later, but perhaps we'll get to that a bit later. Yeah. Um, so she had a very privileged childhood. She grew up near Union Square in New York City. She was the fourth daughter. Uh, eventually there would be seven children in the family. And it appears to me she was the favorite of her father. Her father moved both in Jewish circles and well outside of them. Um, and she was introduced to some very important people, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, whom she met as a very young woman. So her father published a book of her poems written between, and I'm quoting from the title of the book, written between the ages of 14 and 16. And then so there was a second edition between 14 and 17. Uh, and he published this, this book of her poems. So she was precocious. She was a kind of prodigy. She spoke three or four languages. And it seems to me she was tutored in her father's library 
I, I don't have any record that she ever went to a day of school. Um, and in that sense, she was like Christina Rossetti, Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton. Um, so she grew up in a, in a family of great privilege and wealth. Uh, and sh her models were European models uh, for poetry. She wrote long mythological poems. She began writing uh, dramatic monologues in the style of Browning and Tennyson. And gradually over time, she began reading more Jewish history and found that she was very interested in the history of the Jews who came to the United States. And they were Jews who were expelled from Spain and Portugal during the Inquisition. So another myth about her is that she suddenly awakened to her Judaism when Russian Jews began to be persecuted in the 1881, 1881 following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. And this is not true because she was already very interested in Jewish history. But it is true that she embraced the cause of the Jews who were coming in at uh, the rate of 2,000 a month into New York Harbor starting in 1881. And she threw herself into aiding them in various ways. Yeah, can you talk about that, her activism and her teaching? Yeah. She, um, she was told to go there by the editors of the American Hebrew Magazine. She, there meaning the, the refuge on Wards Island where these immigrants were being housed. Um, the Jewish community couldn't cope with, with them. And in fact, there was a lot of alarm in the Jewish community at that time. It followed a, a, some very, very famous anti-Semitic events in the late 70s. And in fact, public charge is a word that's used in the Jewish press. You know, we are afraid that this, quote, army of paupers are going to be public charges. So one thing she tried to do was raise money for them. And she started her own philanthropic organization called, if I can remember, the Society for the Colonization and Improvement of Eastern European Refugees. The very, you know, of its moment, improvement. Um, and the idea was that with jobs and education, that these refugees would become part of the American fabric and not only could be, but had to be assimilated and brought in. She also taught English. Um, she also wrote muckraking articles about the conditions at, at Ward's Island. Um, and one particular visit that she made there, uh, a riot broke out uh, in the refectory while she was there. She didn't speak a word of Yiddish, which was the, the, language, the lingua franca of these immigrants. But still, she went in and tried to calm people down and brought the children out so that they would be safe and managed to help calm people down and help out during this emergency and came back and wrote a very blistering article about the conditions. And within two or three weeks, a cannery had vowed that they would send a ferry to the island and bring back people to work in the cannery. So she was an efficacious muckraker. Um, well, you did mention the, let's see, um, the sugar, the history of, of wealth through sugar. And um, there's a poem that um, she wrote called Progress in Poverty in reference to he Henry George. Can you? Yeah. For us? So um, her father was a, was a New Yorker. He was a northerner. Um, he had a business partner who was from New Orleans. He wasn't as active as other relatives in supporting the Union cause. And I mean, in terms of donating money to benefit soldiers who had been wounded, that kind of thing. Um, he had a lot of ties in the South because he was a sugar refiner. So Emma Lazarus heard about Henry George from uh, her brother-in-law. He's not someone who's talked about very much these days, but he was a reformer who felt the private property was the, the essence of American corruption. And if it could be abolished, it was a very radical idea, if it could be abolished, America would become a much more equitable place. And Lazarus said that when she read Progress and Poverty, it just was like a lightning bolt. She 
she could never be described as a radical in, in any other way. Um, when there were strikes, they always unsettled her very much as she couldn't quite understand why people had to go on strike, that kind of thing. But progress in poverty was uh, a revelation to her. So let me see if I can find that here. So she wrote this poem that appeared in the New York Times uh, in October of 1881. And it's called Progress in Poverty After Reading Mr. Henry George's Book. O oh, splendid age when science lights her lamp at the brief lightning's momentary flame, fixing it steadfast as a star, man's name upon the very brow of heaven to stamp, launched upon a ship whose iron querist sides mock storm and wave. Humanity sails free, gaily upon a vast untraveled sea or pathless wastes to ports undreamed she rides, richer than Cleopatra's barge of gold. This vessel, manned by demigods, with freight of priceless marvels. But where yawns the hold in that deep, reeking hell? What slaves be they who feed the ravenous monster, pant and sweat, nor know if overhead rain night or day? So you may have noticed that some of the language of that would show up in the New Colossus is already yeah. here, the language of the Enlightenment. And this is a satire of Enlightenment uh, complacency, of Gilded Age wealth, of the life of high culture, which was the life she led. And she went to the opera. She loved the symphony. She wrote opera reviews. She went to the museum. Um, she led a very cultured life, and yet she has the insight to see that this that progress and poverty opened up for her this gap between what was going on on the deck of the American ship and what was going on in the hold, which was that slaves, galley slaves, were were powering this ship. So we have the 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 name and flame rhyme, the same rhymes that would show up a couple of years later, but. I think this is not only about poverty, but I think she uses the word slaves, what slaves be they. And to me, this suggests her awareness that her wealth was earned on the backs of slaves, that that's what it meant to have sugar wealth. So for me, this is a, a very important and resonant poem. Um, there's another poem that is the pair poem to the New Colossus of 1492. Yeah. Um, do you want to read that one and yeah. talk about what? So within a few days, Lazarus wrote both the New Colossus and a poem called 1492. And as I said a few minutes ago, this is the date of the uh, exile, the expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal. Um, so Lazarus, I would say her experience of trying to help the persecuted Jews of Russia as they entered New York was a very disillusioning experience. And here she was, a fourth or fifth generation American. And she was finding not only was there anti Semitism uh, in hotels and in spas all over the, the Northeast, um, but there was also a kind of timidity of the American Jewish community that when push came to shove, they weren't as secure as one as, as they might have felt themselves to be. And she found this very disappointing. She found them craven. She found them greedy. And she had a kind of nuanced sense that their greed and their fear were very wrapped up in, in one another. So 1492 is a poem that takes the idea of the immigrants to America and sort of returns it to the question of persecuted Jews. And it's a poem addressed not to the statue, but to the year 1492. So, thou two-faced year, mother of change and fate, didst weep when Spain cast forth with flaming sword the children of the prophets of the Lord 
prince, priest, and people spurned by zealot hate, hounded from sea to sea, from state to state. The West refused them and the East abhorred. No anchorage the known world could afford. Close locked was every port, barred every gate. Then smiling, thou unveilst, O two-faced year, a virgin world where doors of sunset part, saying, ho, all who weary enter here. There falls each ancient barrier that the art of race or creed or rank devised to rear grim bulwarked hatred between heart and heart. So a couple of things that emerge for me here. I mean, one is that while the new Colossus has been faulted for not reckoning with race, not mentioning race, um, here race or creed or rank are mentioned explicitly. Uh, and race meant a variety of things at this point. It, it could mean ethnicity. It could mean uh, race in terms of color. Um, it had a, a broader meaning than it does today. But still, this is a poem about hate mm -hmm. and about the ideal of a new world where hate would dissolve and hate would fall away and barriers would fall away. But I think it's a poem that's doesn't come to a conclusion about whether that is a reality or whether that could be realized in the new world. So this is a poem that I think suggests that, that her interest in the idea of America as a haven for all immigrants is rooted in her experience working on behalf of Jewish immigrants. And Emma Lazarus was someone who just didn't back down. And when her attempts to raise money for the Jewish immigrants met with crushing disappointment, instead of getting quiet, she got louder. And by, by 1883, she was expanding her appeal beyond the Jewish community to the entire American people. But these two issues were very wrapped up in one another. Yeah, I love her personality. It really comes across in your biography, by the way, the, the woman who won't back down. Um, but she's also, she's very powerful writer about anti-Semitism and prescient about it. And I wanted you to read um, at least one more poem, which is um, The Crowing of the Red Cock, uh, The Red Cock, which is one of my favorites, which is about Christian anti-Semitism. Um, and I think in some ways she's, very aware of the danger in the future. Yeah. Um, all right, there's, there's a lot to be said. First of all, the term crowing of the red cock. This was a phrase used um, during pogroms of setting fire to Jewish stores and homes. The red cock has crowed means fire, it's on fire. So it was quoted in the New York Times, that's where she read it. So she wrote The Crowing of the Red Cock um, in the wake of the pogroms of 1881 and 1882. And it has to be said that the, the New York Times, the London Times, the press in Paris, uh, also in Germany, the press was covering this by January, February of 1882. It was known that Jews were being persecuted, raped. Uh, the New York Times gave the number of Jewish girls who had been raped. I mean, this was in the press. And there was a public uh, evening to raise money for the refugees in New York City. Uh, the mayor was there. There were, it was not a Jewish event. I mean, it was a New York City event. And at this moment, not only Jews, but Christians were coming to the aid of these, of these refugees. And Lazarus picked this moment to write a poem about Christian anti-Semitism. So it, it was, you couldn't imagine a, a less politic moment to write this poem, but write it she did. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from it. The Crowing of the Red Cock. Across the eastern sky has glowed the flicker of a blood red dawn. Once more the clarion cock has crowed, once more the sword of Christ is drawn. A billion burning roof trees 
light the worldwide path of Israel's flight. Where is the Hebrew's fatherland? The folk of Christ is, store, is sore bestead. The son of man is bruised and banned, nor finds whereon to lay his head. His cup is gall, his meat is tears, his passion lasts a thousand years. Each crime that wakes in man the beast is visited upon his kind. The lust of mobs, the greed of priests, the tyranny of kings combine to root his seed from earth again. His record is one cry of pain. When the long roll of Christian guilt against his sires and kin is known, the flood of tears, the lifeblood spilt, the agony of ages shown, what oceans can the stain remove from Christian law and Christian love? And that's uh, an excerpt from the poem. She's, she's citing the idea of the Jewish Jesus here, um, that the Jews of Russia are the seed of Jesus Christ. And she wants to make that clear. Uh, she wasn't the only 19th century Jew to be interested in the, the Judaic context and the Judaic origins of Jesus. Um, but the, the idea clearly is that Jesus has been betrayed by anti-Semitic um, priests and mobs. She also wrote uh, dramatic monologues about priests in the, and bishops in the Inquisition, where she takes the role of the anti-Semitic bishop, which is kind of mind-boggling, but um, this is what poets do. She was kind of unafraid to do that. She also wrote a poem in the voice of John Wilkes Booth's mother um, about where the body of her son was. I mean, it's really remarkable. So um, she, I think, used the dramatic monologue form as a way of exploring the psyche of, mm -hmm. of the anti-Semite and found that there wasn't simply one psyche of the anti-Semite, that it, it, anti-Semitism is caught up in the same issues that any life is caught up in issues of power and greed and protection of family and fear of the other and the whole you know, panoply of, of issues. Now, I would also say that she, she was given a, a column in the American Hebrew Magazine in 1879. Um, and she called it Epistle to the Hebrews, which is a very in-your-face, <laughs> very in-your-face title. And this series from 1882 to 1883 became her, sort of her blog. And she would write about, I mean, the, the major theme was raising money for the, uh, the persecuted immigrants. But she would write about whatever she was reading that week and whatever episode in Graz's History of the Jews she had read that week. Uh, and you, it's sort of a record you know, to her biographer. It's a record of her readings and her, and her conversations. Um, but there's a kind of darkening as we go through the, the entries in this column. And by the spring of 83, she, she has said it's at one point that there are four countries in the world where Jews never have any fear, should never ever have any fear, and they are the US, Britain, France, and Germany. And six weeks later, she changes her mind and she begins to advocate for what she calls repatriation, um, also called auto-emancipation. In other words, the word Zionism isn't available, right? This is 15 years before Herzl uh, would come before the first Zionist Congress. Uh, I like to say Herzl was still sitting in cafes thinking he was gonna be a playwright when she was on record advocating for a Jewish homeland. Um, and she was ridiculed for doing so. She was ridiculed on the, the right, meaning the, the Jewish Orthodox establishment. Um, they thought it was messianic and uh, unhandsome and uh, too modern. And she was ridiculed on the left by Reform Jews um, because it was shown to show anxiety about being a Jewish American. And within three or four years, they would publish a platform, the Reform Rabbinate, called the Pittsburgh Platform, which said that American Jews should not support a Zionist homeland. 
Uh, it was not something that American Jews should get behind. So when Emma Lazarus died at the age of 38, um, only one of her obituaries mentioned her Zionism. And that was the editor of the American Hebrew magazine, Philip Cowan. It was an embarrassment for most of the people who lionized her. Um, I am being told to go to questions. I wanna tell you that there's a lot more we've talked about that I would have loved to talk about. Uh, we've heard about her journalism and her columns, but also she was an essayist, a translator, um, and her sisters edited her manuscript after she died. So uh, that has um, repercussions. Uh, anyway, I wanna invite people to come up and ask questions and um, whoever would like to is welcome. There are two mics on either side. So I'll, I'll just say that at this time she wrote it, I had family coming here and I'm a family genealogist in my family. So, you know, I was well aware of the poem on the Statue of Liberty. I haven't been to Liberty Island, but I've seen statue from New York Harbor. Um, and knowing my own family history, um, it's just kind of, um, what's the word? It's it's just nice to sort of hear it coming from you reading it from the perspective of the fact that my own family came in the, well, actually the first one came right after the civil war, but there were more people coming in the 1880s and eight, or early in 19 or in 1890s. So, and then later on also. So I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm curious, she's doing all these things that a typical woman at the time would not do. So can you talk a little bit about her identity as a woman and how that played into all of this? What was the, um, the question is, she did as a woman, a, yeah. Yeah, could you talk about her identity as a woman how, and how that played into all of this? Yeah, her identity as a woman, okay. She could write sort of recessive feminine poems. Alas, because her sister took those recessive feminine poems and sort of put them up front. And her sister Josephine wrote a long sort of melancholy essay about her after she died that became the introduction to the first volume, first collection. And she says she was retiring, she was a saint, it was sort of a saint's life. She was a very bold woman. She had the confidence uh, that one would have if one's father published one's poems <laughs> at the age of 16 or 17. Um, she had male friends and found mentors for herself. You know, there were, she did not go to women for mentoring. Um, Emerson was a mentor of hers. She attached herself to him at a very young age, uh, very brashly. She was 17 or 18 and he was in his 60s. Uh, and there was a falling out when he didn't include her poems in an anthology that he published in 1874. It has to be said he didn't include Poe or Melville either, but Lazarus took it very personally um, and fell out with him. She also was friends with uh, John Burroughs, uh, who was this, a sort of mountain man. She was friends with Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was both her mentor and Emily Dickinson's mentor as a poet. She was friends with William James, who wrote to his wife the night he met her, I have met Ms. Lazarus, a magaziness and a Jewess, and I hope never to be parted from her. When she had a charismatic um, you know, impact on people. So she was unafraid. I, I wouldn't say she was a feminist. Um, it just wasn't a term that was uh, available then. Women's suffrage wasn't really on the table. Friends of hers became involved in it 10 years, 15 years after she died, both for and against, I would add. Uh, but it wasn't an issue uh, on the table for her. I would also say that she found women friends who were artists and writers. 
and most of them were not Jews. In fact, I don't think any of her close women friends were Jews. She was very close friends with Emerson's daughter, Ellen. She was very close friends with Hawthorne's daughter, Rose Lathrop Hawthorne, who after Emma, Emma Lazarus's death, became a Catholic nun and founded a home for cancer patients, inspired by Emma Lazarus, very explicitly. She was also friends with women painters, such as Maria Oki, who married Thomas Dwing. And um, she, these, these friendships were very passionate. They were very important to her. Her sexuality uh, is a sort of big question mark. She never married, but again, she never had to. She was so wealthy that this was simply not something she had to do. And it's clear that having a husband in that milieu would have clipped her wings. And I think she knew that. She was friends with three same-sex couples, women, all women. Um, she had them to her home and she went to their homes. So this is something that was outré for her, for her day and age. And there's a poem in her uh, that, that was excluded by her sisters from their collection called Assurance. Maybe I'll, I'll read yeah. it. Um, and it's a poem explicitly addressed to uh, an erotic other who is a woman. Let's see if I can find this. Let's see. Last night I slept, and when I woke, her kiss still floated on my lips. For we had strayed together in my dream through some dim glade where the shy moonbeams scared, dared light our bliss. The air was dank with dew between the trees. The hidden glowworms kindled and were spent. Cheek pressed to cheek, the cool, the hot night breeze mingled our hair our breath and came and went as sporting with our passion. Low and deep spake in mine ear her voice. And didst thou dream this could be buried? This could be asleep and love be thrall to death? Nay, whatso seem, have faith, dear heart. This is the thing that is. Thereon I woke and on my lips her kiss. So it's a, it's a poem in two voices, like the, the new Colossus. Uh, it seems to be a poem written to uh, someone who is lost or dead. Um, it's clearly written to a woman. But what, can, what conclusion can we draw from this? I, I don't know. Um, when there, there are several other poems, elegies to women, and some of them are fairly erotic also. There is a scholar named Zachary Turpin who collected 15 poems that she published in Lippincott, and I think six or seven of them are addressed to women. When I wrote my book, I wanted to address this poem, and I glossed it by saying, you know, whether she was a lesbian or not, we'll never know, and I sort of sent it off to my editor. And when I got his comments back, he wrote, call me in the margin. <laughs> So I called him and he said, give us what you got. You know, don't, don't hold back. What do you think? You know, what do you think about this? And um, I, I think it's impossible to say whether she had a lesbian relationship. She certainly had passionate feelings toward women. And she certainly shows that she has an erotic life in this poem. And I think it's, it's a very brave poem. And her sisters uh, were very clear that it didn't belong in the posthumous poems. That's a very long answer to the question about her being a woman in this day. Uh, there's been a strong strain of anti-immigration sense uh, in this country, at least since the Constitution. I think those of us living now are a little worried that maybe it's worse now than it ever has been. I'd be interested as whether you agree with that and whether you do or don't, how do we deal with it? 
What's the answer? What are we going to do about, not about immigration, but about anti-immigrant sentiment in the country? I noticed that this session was called the problem of immigration. And uh, when I tweeted out that this was going to happen, I, I predicted that I would hear about that, and I did. I got tweets back, the problem of immigration. Um, OK, so, so one question is, is this, is this anti-immigration sentiment sort of woven into the American fabric? The first anti-immigration laws specifically are 1882, and that's the Chinese Exclusion Act. I would give anything to have a comment from Emma Lazarus about that. I see nothing. I haven't found any mention of it at all. Uh, 1924 is, is the year of the, the first major restrictions that would have a massive impact on American immigration. And the method of restricting immigration was to say, let's go back to the quotas of our population in 1890, and let's have those dictate the quotas uh, from various countries. And the upshot of it was to reduce by about 85% the uh, number of immigrants that were here between, that naturalized in the 1900 to 1935. And the depression had something to do with that also. Um, the percentage of, just to give us another sense of how impactful this law was, 19, uh, 1890, let's see, 1900, I think there were 15% of all Americans were foreign born. By 1965, it was 5%. And 1965 is when these quotas are finally overturned. So, you know, I, I think the fact, you know, the, the general feeling in my circles was that when Trump was out of office, we would return and be restored to our values and that American that the, the Trump era rules and proclamations would be rolled back. In fact, um, Title 42, which is um, a rule that says in, an, in a health emergency, the CDC can request the, the, the limitation of immigration. That's a summary, um, which was put in by Trump in in 2020, um, and Biden said he was planning to roll it back. It's received a lot of criticism by public health uh, authorities. Um, Biden, in fact, hasn't rolled this back, and it was used to expel, I think, uh, 1.3 million people who came to the to the border, the Mexican border, in the in the last year. And the most publicized um, incident was the expulsion of Haitians, uh, the deportation of Haitians, I think 13,000 Haitians within eight days in September, this September. So Title 42 has been limited a couple of times, but I think COVID was just a, a massive opportunity for anti-immigrationists to sort of step in and sort of, you know, put, put the barriers back up. Uh, and it continues to be uh, a problem in anti-immigration sentiment. I don't think it can, you know, I think that would be asking a lot of human nature to expunge anti-immigration or fear of the other uh, permanently. Um, but I think programs like the Dreamer program, the idea of a pathway to citizenship, these are programs that have an, a really concrete impact. And I think once immigrants are in power, making these decisions and are teaching in universities and are, you know, I, I think that's the kind of thing that changes first generation programs. The kind of values that Roosevelt University, I have to, I have to say, um, was dedicated to um, making a reality. Hi, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Uh, this is gonna seem very elementary, but I wanna turn away from immigration and as a writer, as you were researching Emma Lazarus's life, is there a question that you wish you could go back and ask her? What is something you really hoped or wish that you could have sat down and had a conversation with her about? Oh, 
to be honest, my question is, why couldn't you have lived longer? Aww. So here is this woman who wrote in so many different arenas. She wrote essays. She wrote poems. She wrote plays. We haven't even talked about her plays. Um, she wrote opera criticism. Uh, she wrote many different kinds of poems. She wrote, she was a translator. We also haven't talked about that, but she was the preeminent translator of Heine in, in the 19th century into English. Um, she was an activist. She wrote to different audiences. I mean, she was the first person to write about anti-Semitism for a mainstream American audience in the pages of the Century Magazine. So she wrote to both Jewish audiences and to middle-brow mainstream audiences. What would have become of her? In other words, what would she have become? What would she have turned herself into? Um, there are moments when I've thought she might have been an amazing playwright. She could have been an amazing theater critic. She could have been a poet who worked toward experiments that she was just had a glimmer of in her final years. She wrote the first prose poem in English um, called By the Rivers of Babylon, By the Waters of Babylon, and it is about the expulsion of Jews from Spain. So, you know, that's my question is what, what could, what could you have done if you had lived longer? Thank you very much, of course, for coming. Um, I told my students you were coming, and they asked, of course, what you work on. And rightly or wrongly, I said, well, lots of things, <laughs> uh, but two things in particular. Uh, Emma Lazarus, on whom you've written a biography, and Mary Shelley. <clears throat> You're the editor of the companion to Mary Shelley. Two women, prominent women, uh, the broad breadth of the 19th century is covered by them. So I started wondering whether they had something in common on the basis of some theme that you attached yourself to, either explicitly or tacitly. So I have a question, a very specific question, about the poem, The New Colossus, in relationship to Mary Shelley. Frankenstein comes out in 1818, of course you know, and it's subtitled The Modern Prometheus. Prometheus steals fire from Zeus, and this is why, in one reading of the myth, and this is why he's punished, he, and he gives this fire to human beings. <laughs> Zeus's fire, of course, was lightning. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last Zeus's one. Zeus's fire, yeah. of course, was lightning. Yes. And then in the modern Colossus, her flame is the imprisoned lightning. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is whether there is in the New Colossus an antipathy not only to imperialism, but a certain understanding of the Greek world. That's how the sonnet begins. That's what's being rejected as something problematic. And she sees, <coughs> excuse me, wearing a mask all day does this. Uh, she sees herself as being a female modern Prometheus who has figured out a way to liberate human beings, I would say from land, from nationalism and from imperialism. In any case, given the modern Prometheus and given this image of the imprisoned lightning, which it's hard to see it's not an allusion to Prometheus. I wonder if you think there's any relationship between them. Did Lazarus read Prometheus? And whether you see thematically something at stake here. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> um, what, a, what a great question. I guess, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that both Mary Shelley, who was Mary Godwin, and Emma Lazarus were doted on by their fathers and nurtured by their fathers and raised to think that they could think about anything, read about anything, um, speak several languages, 
and think about, be, be a woman of ideas. So that's, I think, the first thing. They both had that kind of grounding. Both Frankenstein and The New Colossus are poems that are skeptical of the Enlightenment, of a kind of Enlightenment worship. Now, I know you you mentioned imperialism and nationalism. I'll get to that. But I, I think uh, the modern Prometheus um, is, a, is a figure who um, usurps knowledge from nature. Now, the, the lightning iconography in the Frankenstein story comes from 1931 from the James Whale film. And there's some lightning in the novel, but not much. I mean, that lightning bolt that comes down and strikes him, and that's life. Um, that's, that's from the film. Uh, but I, I think the idea that, um, that the Enlightenment is, is a, something that's worshipped and that the fire should be distributed, that, the, the, that that is what fire is for. The fire is to, to light up the world and not to be kept on Olympus. So I, I think that's something that's in common. Um, both Mary Shelley and Emma Lazarus were anti-nationalist. I mean, Mary Shelley lived in Italy. I think she probably would have stayed there many years if her husband hasn't drowned and she fell on hard times. Unlike Emma Lazarus, she had to write for money after for most of her life. And all those encyclopedia articles that she wrote, I mean, she did them to feed herself and her son. Um, so in that sense, they're not similar. But is Emma Lazarus a kind of Promethean figure is, is what you're at? Is that what, what? A new Prometheus. A new Prometheus, yeah. Um, a new Colossus, a new Prometheus. She was arrogant and she had a healthy ego, but I don't think she was thinking about herself as anything but a poet. And I think that was the essence of who she was, who she wanted to be. She did this work because it needed to be done, but she didn't think of herself as a philanthropist. Uh, she didn't think of herself as an activist. Um, this was work that had an urgent message to her. She had a calling. And the way she writes about becoming involved with the refugees is, is the language of calling. She, and she writes this to Rose Hawthorne. I think she was the one to whom Lazarus was most candid about this, and also suggesting that it, it filled a kind of void in her life, I think. I think she wanted to be thinking about important issues, and this kind of came in front of her. She was asked to pay attention to it, and, and she did. So. I love the idea. I'm going to have to think about that a bit more. Can you go to the mic? Thank you. So in 1883, I believe I have the date correct, this is the first time that a city in Europe is electrified in Surrey, England. My memory is that that's when Emma Lazarus goes to Europe. And this was a major occurrence because instead of having to be inside, say at four or five o'clock or have fire lighting roads, and crime was eliminated, was diminished greatly, not eliminated, because of the electrification of cities. This was a new hope, a new possibility. Uh, so I wonder also, light is in the air. And now we have this imprisoned lightning, which is going to light the way for individuals to find something they hitherto were unable to find previously. Could be a coincidence, but uh, my guess is, well, I don't know whether it's a coincidence. It's a striking coincidence if it's that. I, I would say also that the, the lightning is, even though imprisoned, is strong enough to show the, the statue what's out there. I mean, when she sees the huddled masses, she's seeing what this light allows her to see. Um, and the poem has been criticized, uh, not only for huddled masses, but for wretched refuse. And I saw David Brooks a week ago, 10 days ago, 
said that he thought it was a humiliating poem. He thought it was a poem that was, he lines it up with other statements that are designed to humiliate immigrants. And uh, I just can't agree with him there. You know, the, the word refuse, I think Lazarus is getting from the French refusé, you know, the Salon de Refusé. These are the artists who have been turned away, who have been turned away by the establishment. And these are people who have been refused, who are the, the wretched refuse. Um, and this is the line that was left out when the sonnet was quoted in, in Kennedy Airport. It was put up on a wall in Kennedy Airport and they left out, they published only, the, they, they put up 13 lines of the poem and left out the wretched refuse line. Uh, it's, a, it's a line that makes a lot of people uneasy. Mm -hmm. um, but another, uh, another idea, I think this is Shira Woloski's idea, is that the lightning has to do with the figure of Barak, the biblical figure of Barak, Deborah and Barak, that, that she is a figure who is associated with lightning uh, and also the prophet Isaiah. So there are biblical res there's a biblical resonance to it also. And, and frankly, I think that the Hebraic idea of loving kindness or chesed is there in the, the, the mother of exiles. And I think that is what she has to offer. Worldwide welcome, that's a kind of lame, lame word for it. I think what, what she's really offering is chesed, loving kindness. With that, if you would join me in applauding <laughs> Professor Shore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I don't want this conversation to end. Can we keep you here for another few hours, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, Professor Shore, for coming to Roosevelt University uh, for the illuminating discussion about Emma Lazarus. And, you know, thank you so much, Professor Anne-Marie Cusack, for moderating, and also Professor Kim Ruffin for introducing the panel uh, and doing the hard work that, you know, takes into organizing this week. Uh, I cannot think of a more fitting subject for our final panel than Lazarus. And, you know, just on the topic of immigration, uh, six years ago when we conceived this conference, we said, let's call it the American dream. And I think uh, our philosopher, uh, Stuart Warner, of course, said, no, no, let, let's call it American dream reconsidered so that we can come at it from every perspective. And I think, thanks, Stuart, for that insight, because it allows us to look at it from every perspective. And as you know, immigration, as an immigrant, I know that. Uh, immigration for us is just these uh, waves. It will come, we allow immigration to happen, and then, of course, we will ban the Muslims, we will ban the Chinese, we will ban this and that. But it's too late. That's my uh, good news to all immigrants and to all our students as well. It's too late. We're much more of a multicultural nation than we used to be when Emma Lazarus wrote this poem as well. Um, so I think it gives us hope and it allows us to think about the American dream reconsidered so that we can leave a much better nation behind for all of us. So for that and for the conversation, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.